All right. So we're going to take it out of the deal pretty hard. Yeah. <laughs> My real name is Gustav Adolf Weigart Jr., but uh, my, I'm known by my nickname of Dobby. I'm vice president of Weigart Brothers, which is also known as Jolly Roger, and uh, been in the business since the 1874 as the family business. Well, Grandpa used to work by sailboat. He would tong oysters when he first started onto a scow, which is a, a, a flat bottom boat. Tongs are long rakes, which you can float over the oyster ground with, with your scow, the wooden boat, and tong the oysters by extending them down into the water. The tongs are like two rakes that are joined together, hinged, and when you uh, put the handles together, it closes the tongs, and the oysters are inside the tongs. Then when you think they're full, you pick them up, swing, a sh swing them aboard, tip the tongs sideways, and they drop out, and keep doing that. Then uh, they took the Originally, the oystermen took their uh, native oysters on the scow, and they would go up to the high tide line at uh, high water and shovel their oysters over. Then when the tide went out, they would go and pick the biggest oysters out and leave the rest. Well, they re eventually realized that the, that the uh, oysters they left that were too small were dying at this high tide level. So they staked out oyster ground at the lower tide level and put them out there. Then they would go out at low tide, 
pick them out, the, the marketable oysters, when the sailing ship would come in from San Francisco, and leave the little ones, and eventually they would grow up to, to marketable size. That industry kept going up at its peak until about the 1890s, when for a variety of reasons they're not sure, this native industry uh, declined and declined <clears throat> until eventually about the uh, 1900s they decided to bring in oyster uh, seed from the east coast, the Austria Virginica. Uh, they originally brought them in by seed, and, but then it took too long for them to grow. So they brought in half-grown, uh, half-matured oysters and by rail car grew those so that they would grow in a couple of years. Well, for some reason, we're not sure because they didn't have the uh, techniques to determine why, those oysters all died out in about 1919. So most of the oystermen were out of business, and 80 oyster had declined to a, an unprofitable uh, level. The East Coast oysters had uh, died out, so for several years, there, were, there really weren't many oysters. Uh, my uncle, Fred, however, kept working in the oyster business, and because he did this, uh, our family has been told that we have been in the business longer than any family continuously in the United States. We're now into our fifth generation. Well, eventually, in the late 1920s and 30s, they began experimenting with the Pacific oyster, Austria gigas, from Japan. And that's, they found that that oyster adapted very well to this bay climate and uh, water quality. <clears throat> it's an oyster that is, is now grown in Australia, New Zealand, England, France, the United States and Canada, and uh, does quite well in certain areas. Very adaptable. But that's the oyster that we're using today. So, so you can see that we have we're on our third type of oyster, and the farming techniques have uh, improved over the years. We do many of the things <coughs> that uh, upland farmers do. We use pasture harrows. Uh, we plant the seed, we create the seed sometimes in the hatcheries, and we plant it, we cultivate the oysters, uh, we cultivate our crops, and uh, do many of the things that uh, upland farmers do, except we're doing it in the water. My name's Larry Warrenberg. My business is Nakata Oyster Farm. You can see out there some dark spots uh, from a distance. It just looks like a mass, but those are around 60,000 plastic stakes stuck in the mud. Uh, and we grow our oysters off the bottom so that they're not down in the mud. They grow faster and have better quality. Um, so we'll be going out there to check it out. Sandy, my wife and I rent uh, lease about 10 acres of tide lands. We have a path down to the bay. So the tide comes in here and uh, keeps our oysters wet and happy until we need them. So we keep a small inventory up here and we're rotating through it every couple of days. Me and the fellow who got me into oyster farming, Jack Weigart, whose family owns some of the ground I lease. We developed a method that works here, but it's based on an, an old technique that's used in many parts of the world to grow oysters on various kinds of stakes. Uh, I think Jack's innovation was using PVC pipe. Uh, now the Japanese and Filipinos use uh, bamboo stakes. Uh, in France, they use uh, a, a 
roofing tile, which is a, one of the roofing tiles. They're about two feet long and they're semi-circular shape. Well, they stick those in the mud and the oyster spat will attach to them. So we use the stakes. Other growers use lines that hang on the stakes, uh, which we did for some years. But we found that just growing them on the stakes was easier and uh, cheaper, more efficient. Over the years that I've been farming oysters, I've tried to uh, be innovative and find other ways to grow oysters because there's no one way that, and each area needs to be developed in, for its best potential. Um, we do have a lot of uh, shrimp, burrowing shrimp here, so the stakes help us in a way. We also use racks. Here you can see another rack uh, that will hold holds bags of single oysters. Extensive tide flats we see here are not natural. This bay is much shallower than it used to be um, due to a number of things. You know, the native oysters were over harvested before the turn of the century and what remained of the oyster reefs were buried under mud that came from poor logging practices up the hillsides. And so when all that mud flushed into the bay, uh, it created different habitat. And along with that came many non-native species. The latest one to scare us is the green crab. Now the, the uh, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife uh, loans us crab traps. They're actually a minnow trap that's modified or used for crabs. Let's see if I can get it open. They're not the easiest to open though. There we go. So we put these out with some bait in the bait can to try to uh, monitor the green crab population. So far, I've had these traps, three traps out here for the past month, and I haven't found one. But other people are finding them, so they may show up eventually. Now this is a Dungeness crab, little one. Uh, the green crabs get a little bigger than that at full growth, but of course Dungeness crabs get quite large. And uh, the Dungeness crabs are an important commercial uh, crop where the, the green crabs don't have any real food value or meat in them. And uh, the, con one, the main concern is that the green crab will um, displace the Dungeness crab, the native. Again, it's like the Spartina. Uh, there's a concern that the non-native species will displace the native species. And I might say that the stake method is, uh, is not as intense, uh, dense oyster farming as the line method. Now we used to hang line from stake to stake in tight rows and there would be a cluster of oysters on each line a foot apart and we could harvest it in a boat at high tide. I used a canoe to harvest for many years. But we found that all those lines uh, caused more sediment and, and the, the ground level was coming up. So we got rid of the line method and went just to the stakes where when we saw that the oysters will uh, naturally set on the stakes here very well. That's not true at every place in the bay, but here we, we get good seed catch. And, and what it does is it allows the current to take some of the silt away so our ground level has stabilized. fed so it's a nice plump crisp oyster and it's just for our dog Muttley. Here, Muttley. Yeah. Here's a 
couple two-year-olds there. They're sellable, but I'll leave a few because this summer when the oysters spawn, the little larvae, they'll look for that oyster to stick on and uh, he'll, he'll provide a base for the next crop and greatly increase the, the surface area on that stake. You see all the barnacles too. Uh, those increase the surface area and give the oyster larvae something they like to hang on to, which is something clean and hard. Now they'll stick on to a clean stake, but they'd rather stick on to a barnacle. Um, so when I put out new stakes, like at the beginning of summer, I give them a few months to catch barnacles. So in August, when the oysters are swimming around looking for a home, uh, there's a lot of little barnacles on that stake and I'll get a much better seed catch. And here's some nice three-year-olds. We'll take those. Now you can see how much mud there is. Even though these oysters are off the bottom, that's some of the best topsoil washed down from the hillsides. We collect a lot of that when we rinse our oysters up on shore. Some of the oysters will fall off the stakes from, from a winter storm wave action or just as they grow. Sometimes they'll force each other off and they'll fall off. You saw how that one was just laying there. So if, if it hasn't been in the mud very long, I, I pick those up. Now ones that have been like this down in the mud for a while and half buried in the mud, they're going to be thin and kind of watery oysters. So I can tell by where they are and how they look that this is not a choice oyster. But now you can see that one is kind of thin and watery. It's not, not creamy and meaty like the, uh, the other one I showed you. That's because he was on the underside, down in the mud. He wasn't getting very much food, but he's good enough for dogs. Some of the ones on the top of that clump were getting good food, and I'll take those. There's a nice one. Here's a, here's a steak that got uh, blasted by a storm we had just recently. Get that one. Get that one. So these oysters have just recently fallen to the bottom. They, the, the cluster on the stake fell. So uh, those are mostly good. There's a nice four-year-old. These grow about an inch a year. There's a three-year-old that was growing alongside of it. 
most oysters in this bay are grown on the bottom in a single age class of uh, often hatchery produced seed. Not entirely, so wild seed is collected, but, but hatcheries uh, provide a, a significant amount of seed for the big growers. That seed is put on beds that may have been sprayed to kill the sand shrimp to firm up the ground. And that single age class of oysters is raised up um, and then it's harvested mechanically with a dredge basket at high tide. 
I'm running about 500 bushels a day right now. Uh, going November and December, those are our busy months. We'll uh, run about a thousand a day. Um, I run my openers about six hours a day. This is all uh, all piece work. They get paid by the bucket. Uh, what I do is every day I take random counts, and that's how we figure out their wage for the day. Most of these guys have been with me quite a while. Uh, uh, yeah, I don't have a, a turnover problem at all. through the opening machine and let you see that, that, that's quite impressive you guys you guys are like that basically what he's doing now he's putting on this is a high hydrostatic pressure unit it's capable of pressures between uh, 15,000 and 60,000 psi of high hydrostatic pressure what we're doing here is we've loaded this is a product basket it holds about a bushel of oysters we loaded the basket with with the oysters, these are fresh oysters in the shell, and uh, attach the cap. And what Rob's going to do now is he's going to lift this basket up and into the high pressure machine. Um, this particular machine was designed and built by Flow International, which is a Washington company based in Kent. It uh, it's what they call a twin 45 liter machine. Uh, it has two isolators. Is capable of running, alternating running two of these these pressure baskets. Just sees a flashing light indicates that it's pumping up to pressure. For the oysters, in order to shuck these oysters, we'll hold them for about a nine, 90 seconds. So we'll hold them at uh, the designated pressure for about 90 seconds. Uh, we use pressures. Our pressures range between uh, 20,000 and 45,000. Um, 150 horsepower electric pump and it comes up to pressure in about 20 seconds.
oyster just drops out of the uh, drops out of the shell. Apparently, it unravels a protein matrix that severs the adductor muscle from the shell. So that's the that's the uh, that's the process. I mean, basically the consumer doesn't want to spend a lot of time cooking. Um, if we can come up with products that are essentially ready to eat and, uh, and are good, and are good for you. I mean, that's the idea. It's a natural product and it's a, it's a very good food source. Well, oystering is, is hard work. There's a lot of back-breaking work and uh, the biggest challenge for the industry is clean water because if we don't have clean water in this bay uh, we can grow oysters but we can't sell them. Now in addition we're very concerned about the invasive species of Spartina that's come into the bay that's encroaching on the, the tidal, uh, upper tidal lands and gradually working their way out. Not only does it affect oyster ground but it affects clam ground, it affects some migratory birds and uh, it's, it's a problem. We also have a problem with the ghost shrimp, which make the, uh, the ground, the prime oyster ground, and, and non-prime ground, very soft, unsuitable for growing oysters. A heavy oyster would eventually sink into the sand and disappear and die. My name is Brett Dumble. I'm a fisheries research scientist, is my official title with the Department of Fish and Wildlife. I spend the majority of, I would say, the majority of my time on uh, on sort of larger management issues like like the carbaryl ghost shrimp spray stuff, and um, even Spartina. I spend time on Spartina and dredging and other issues that impact. I kind of view my purview as as the coastal estuaries and sort of what goes on in the coastal estuaries. In '88, I started my uh, Ph. worked towards a doctoral degree, and that was in Willapa Bay with regard to the um, carbaryl shrimp, burrowing shrimp issue. It's a pesticide that is a, uh, it's a nervous system toxin. It blocks activity of acetylcholinesterase um, enzyme at the uh, nerve synapse, is what it does, in insects primarily, because it's targeted at insects or arthropods. So arthropod is a general group, and insects are uh, what it was um, designed to go after in terrestrial agriculture. Really commonly used uh, pesticide up through the 80s. But it was widely used and the main reason is because it has very low toxicity to mammals and humans. So you could buy it in, and I think you can probably still buy it in the uh, garden store and dust your vegetables with it, eat, eat them within 24 or 48 hours, something like that. It doesn't magnify, biomagnify in the food chain like some of the ones that when you hear the word pesticide, everybody envisions DDT and those things. Um, it doesn't do that. Um, that's another reason it was chosen. Well, there are two varieties of burrowing shrimp, a sand shrimp and a mud shrimp. Um, they're pretty similar but they have some differences in their biology and their life patterns, life cycles. But in both cases, they, they tunnel and make the ground soft and spongy and will cause increased mortality in oyster crops that are grown on the bottom. Uh, spraying will temporarily firm up the ground to allow uh, a, a crop of oysters to be grown, but it has to be repeated. It's not a long-term control of the shrimp. Well, my name is Richard Wilson, and uh, I'm founder and president and large owner of what we call Bay Center Mariculture, Bay Center Farms. Remember that it was discovered, you know, in the 50s, basically, that something was ruining the bay. Now, I want to make a real point right off the bat that we, we do spray to maintain ground so that we can raise oysters. But it's the same quality of the bottom that raises all the other things in the estuary. So those areas that haven't been sprayed are basically lost at this point and this day, gone. They're gone. The, the agencies that are responsible for it have sort of turned a blind eye on it. 
because they don't want to deal with the fact that it's happening. We have dealt with the fact that it's happening because our livelihood is involved and it's our own ground that's involved. We own our ground out there that's involved. Okay, so they noticed <coughs> that they would plant oysters out there and like, you know, during the war they grew all kinds of oysters out here. There were oysters all over the place and beautiful photography of oysters just thick on the beds. And then they noticed that um, during the 50s they'd plant oysters out, you know, the seed that they'd collect from the natural set areas. And uh, lo and behold, nothing would show up. And they'd dig underneath, they'd find it underneath the ground, or it'd be dead, be covered with silt, etc. The ground got spongy, you could hardly walk on it. And obviously, it didn't take a rocket scientist, the farmers knew. It was burrowing shrimp. They were destroying the bottom of the estuary. They were destroying the entire biota and making it into a unispecies type of situation. As it turns out, I mean, I spend a lot of my time dealing with habitat issues, actually, in a way, because my perspective is is that the oysters provide a lot of habitat out there, and, and the way they influence the environment out there is really a habitat way. These are sand shrimp up here. The mud shrimp are a little deeper. But you can see how the ground is soft and spongy. Right. Those shrimp burrow like moles, and they make the ground soft with their tunneling. Right. And for the growers that raise oysters on the bottom, right. they, uh, they the, sink. that causes the oysters to sink and suffocate. So they firm the beds up by killing the shrimp with a pesticide, and then they can get a crop out of it with less mortality. Changes. Oh, there were changes, yes. Because the estuary would not have survived like they saw it in the 40s, had the shrimp been as predominant as they are now. There wouldn't be anything on the bottom. Absolutely desert. Like Tillamook Bay has turned into be. It's a shame. They've ruined Tillamook because they wouldn't allow them to treat the ghost shrimp. But it was the Department of Fisheries and the National Marine Fisheries Service, or their equivalent at that time, U.S. Fisheries Service, or whatever it was called, that really came out and did the work to discover and test which pesticide at that time would be the best to, and they used some awful things, lindane and oh, some horrible, horrible chemicals. Um, and they came up with uh, carbaryl because it was benign and I mean it disappeared, it broke down and everything, it was just a great chemical to use to treat the ground. We don't treat the oysters, we treat the ground. And they found it go away and after that people could start farming again. Uh, if that had not been discovered and not used, there probably wouldn't be much of an oyster industry in Mopa Bay. Virtually none. There's two species of shrimp. That's the other issue that I've spent a fair amount of time on, is, is the two species of shrimp are different as well. But particularly when you have ghost shrimp present, they turn over that sediment so rapidly that the only things that can coexist with them are um, organisms that are adapted to that kind of an environment. Wilpaw grows over half of the oysters in Washington State, and Washington State grows over a third in the United States. So we, we have big production here. <clears throat> but all, I would say, I don't know, maybe you can get a better estimate from someone else, but I would say between 85 and 95 percent of the oysters are on the ground, the volume of oysters coming off the ground. You couldn't grow them on the ground if you weren't controlling the shrimp. Basically, every single good fattening bed or harvest bed in the bay is sprayed or treated for shrimp. Great. Um. Now, the, the people that are really into chemicals say, well, so what? Let it go. Yeah, I mean, it's better to have a bay that's sterile with nothing in it <clears throat> than to put this chemical in the bay. So that's what you're bucking. That, that's, the, that's the situation you're bucking. But what they fail to um, realize when they make that statement is they're going to kill off probably 75% of the other species that would be in the area and depend on the ground right. and depend on the oysters, right. which is an interesting situation. Uh, the oyster industry has put a lot of effort into promoting this bay as the cleanest, most pristine bay in the continental United States. And in some ways it is, but that doesn't uh, explain the fact that they put 7,000 pounds of carbaryl in the bay every summer, or doesn't justify it. And this pesticide is used only in this bay and in Grays Harbor. Of all the shellfish growing areas, in the whole United States. It's only two estuaries where that practice is allowed. As far as sort of the impacts of carbaryl, um, I think they're fairly restricted to the areas where the growers have uh, 
decided or have planned out there. In one way that the studies, not just mine but others as well, have influenced this is that's why it's still being used. That's how I feel. If you didn't have, if the, ag the agencies wouldn't be very satisfied and uh, the public outcry would probably have been enough to um, shut it down and have been in other states where they haven't taken the time to do that work, like Oregon, for example, um, that I don't think the growers would be using it. Our agencies wouldn't have been, you know, the agencies in Washington wouldn't have been able to stand up to the public outcry and say, hey, you know, look at this research here, here's what's been done, and it doesn't have the impacts that you are saying it might have. If you didn't have that background, then it wouldn't hold up and uh, they wouldn't be utilizing the pesticide. And that, you know, that could still happen now, too. I mean, you know, it's always, that's always the issue. And, you know, it's unfortunate for the growers. They would like to get to some place where they have a stable thing and they can just keep doing it, like you just said. Um, and I just think with a pesticide use in the estuary, that's going to be a hurdle, you know, unfortunately for the growers for a long time. The shrimp are indigenous to the two Pacific Northwest estuaries. So you will hear the opinion, perhaps, uh, from some of the growers uh, that don't like the shrimp for, and for good reason, don't, you know, don't, you know, see them as pests. But shrimp also have a role to play in the estuary, so I'm, and I'm not going to, um, say that they don't. You can't plant long lines and have have the same equivalent. You can't do it. The long lines fall over, and the stuff on the long lines falls in and sinks. I mean, they, they. I don't know if you guys have ever had the experience of walking across a shrimp bed. It is it is it's quicksand. This is a oyster shell reef that we've created over the years, and if you put enough oyster shell down, the shrimp will be choked out. And, and then the oysters won't sink so much. That's the main reason we grow our oysters off the bottom on stakes is to avoid spraying the shrimp. So we get along with the shrimp fine. That's great. In fact, I think they're beneficial. They work like earthworms to aerate the ground and they keep it aerobic. And uh, I think they improve the quality of water. So the diversity and abundance is highly magnified by the fact that the oysters are there. The oysters are there because of the fact that we spray the ground. If you don't spray the ground, then we don't farm it after a while because we, we there's no use wasting money on seed because it won't be there. There's nothing there for the critters to live in, and that's it. So, asking the question, are we causing the negative impact in a sense? No. Just the opposite. That's what Every thought. study has pointed out that we create a very positive impact on the environment. And the, and the bay is still rich because we have created this, this uh, oh, probably 10,000 acres of rich habitat. One of the complaints the growers um, have, uh, have had is sort of is they can't get out of that box and move on and, and continue to utilize this. And so they're always fighting that carbaryl battle. And I agree with them in many ways because we've done study after study on carbaryl use. So I think we know a fair amount about what happens with carbon, enough to feel reasonably comfortable with its current use. Everybody thinks that um, a pesticide is bad, and and I guess in one sense it does make you think that it's being used because something else went wrong. Well, in a sense that's true, but. Uh, so it's chemotherapy. Yeah, I understand. <laughs> I think, you know, um, the natural environment and really a, one of the big, bigger players is sort of what goes on in the coastal ocean and how we as humans on a larger scale influence what happens to uh, the ocean and things is what's going to really um, impact the industry more than uh, and the water quality in the bay to some extent. And then those development issues really far more important really in, in the larger context than uh, the carbaryl and dredging and the things that the birds do on their beds. I think they're relatively short-term and small-scale. Martina got here accidentally uh, in about the mid-1890s. Uh, by that time the native oysters had pretty much been depleted by over-harvesting and buried by mud uh, from the logging practices. And so some entrepreneurs decided uh, to try importing oyster seed from the Chesapeake and the oyster seed was on shelves uh, and it was packed in barrels using the Spartina grass, which is native to the East Coast. The grass was used to pack the seed to keep it damp and moist. 
uh, that was done for two seasons, but the mortality during the two-week train trip across the country was, was really high. And the oysters didn't do very well here, again, because of the mud. The eastern oysters are a little faster growing than the native Olympia oysters, but not that much. They're a fairly slow growing, small variety oyster, and they just didn't do well here. But the grass took hold. It loved all the mud and uh, gradually spread around the upper inner tidal zone of the bay, and it's rapidly filling that niche. The grass is a symptom of underlying disturbances, mostly too much mud being stirred up and the grass will trap the silt and it builds the elevation. And here you can see a pretty good rise. Well that's all accumulated sediment that the grass has trapped over year after year. And then it sort of creates its own habitat. Um, as it raises the ground level it will eventually turn into salt marsh. If we sat back and did nothing it would be a big issue I think because it progrades across and creates marsh. So if we just did nothing, throw up our hands and do nothing, don't even pull seedlings, which is not going to happen. This, you know, the growers are going to protect their beds by at least pulling seedlings, so this isn't going to happen. But if we did, didn't, if we just sort of let it grow, and there are some areas where they have done that, so we have evidence of that. Um, yeah, it's a huge issue. We would be raising oysters in the channels for the most part here, which aren't very extensive in Wolpaw. You know, 50% and most of where oystering currently goes on is on the mud flats. So yeah, it's a huge issue as far as that goes. Will that happen? No, because the growers are going to pull seedlings on their beds. Right now it's up on the fringes and it's prograding across what they use for seed ground right now. High ground where they're just raising oyster seeds, small stuff. The oysters just don't fatten that, um, up high in the inner tidal, so they have to take them to their best beds out near the estuary mouth. But if they just sat back and did nothing, you know, in a hundred years from now, yeah, we'd have an east coast Spartina marsh out to, and it would prograde across, maybe not all of that ground, but a, a, a fair amount of the ground that they, they currently utilize. Had I not taken care of the Spartina on my property by spraying, mowing, having my grandchildren out there pulling uh, seedlings, doing it myself, my whole tide front would probably be solid Spartina out for about maybe 200 feet from the bank. This would be land that was lost to migratory waterfowl use. One thing it does, the Spartina grows from one seedling. It can grow from seeds or from the rhizomes, kind of like bamboo, and it'll start it out with one shoot and then it grows out in a circle and when you get a Spartina mound that's about 50, 60 feet in diameter, if you walk up and stand on the top of the mound it might be a foot, foot and a half higher than the surrounding tide flats. So it gradually raises the, uh, the uh, elevation of some of the tide flats. The migratory waterfowl do not feed in the Spartina. So as Spartina encroaches on the upper tide land, it means less feeding area for the migratory waterfowl. Now we use a gas-powered weed eater mostly with a, with a blade, steel blade, and we cut it pretty low to the mud line. Each, each mowing will knock it back about 20%. So each time there's less of it. And we've gotten rid of some pretty big humps of it, or they're called clones but they do occasionally set seed, and that seed will grow a foot or so a year, and each year will make a big round patch, uh, and then those round patches will merge together into meadows, as you see here. By far, the most of the growth of the Spartina grass is from the roots, it's not from seeds. But getting the seedlings is part of the strategy, too. Problems like Spartina are just symptoms of underlying disturbances. And the, really the main problem is too much erosion upland producing sediment into the bay. Uh, and that nourishes the Spartina and causes, the, causes its expansion. We know what happens to estuaries as they gradually fill in. After all, the bay is at the bottom of the watershed. 
It's the last stop before the ocean. And it receives all the sediment and all the nutrients and all the pollutants that are coming down the streams and the creeks and the rivers. And here we are farming a, a filter feeder, shellfish, you know, clams and oysters and mussels are going to take up some of those toxins. And we're lucky here that we, most of our bay is still farmable. Uh, as I said, in Puget Sound, 40% is not harvestable, and that number is going up steadily. And my wife and I were back in, uh, in Virgin Virginia a few years ago and uh, took a side trip up over the Chesapeake Bay Bridge into uh, the eastern shore of Maryland. And I was amazed at how large Chesapeake Bay was. And I'd, of course, been reading stories about all the problems in Chesapeake Bay and realized that there are many states surrounding Chesapeake Bay, many large cities, uh, all kinds of farms. And all of these were potentially contributing to the demise of the oyster industry in Chesapeake through pollution. And it got me to realize that uh, we're lucky that our bay is the cleanest estuary in the United States. It's in win within one county uh, in one state. And w that's, a, that's a big asset. In Puget Sound, 40% of the shellfish growing areas are not fishable. You can't harvest the, the oysters or clams from those areas because of pollution. In this bay, it's only about 2%. That's why there's pretty good justification for the claim that this is a relatively pristine bay. We, we have better guidelines for development now than there were in the past. And so there's a lot more attention paid to wastewater treatment. Uh, logging practices are improving. Um, there are better, bigger setbacks from shorelines and from streams. Uh, there's better stormwater control. Uh, so I think we can have a smart development and we can still maintain a viable shellfish industry. The industry is probably at the forefront of, of hatchery production of oysters. Years ago, uh, all this seed came from Japan on ships. That no longer happens. The, the industry has developed the techniques and the hatcheries to sustain itself with seed and is doing a very good job. It's probably at the forefront of um, artificial uh, production of oyster seed in, in, in the U.S. Well, there's a lot of learning involved. We made some mistakes, but we also made significant progress. We have a, a good local business. We sell high-quality oysters that are affordable. We're economically competitive. So I think it's been a, an overwhelming success. This is a high protein, a very pure food source. Uh, it would be nice to have the consumer uh, accept maybe a couple different product forms. You could take oyster meats, for example, put them in a packet with uh, sauces or spices, and then you could infuse the flavor. Because the high pressure is instantaneous, all the way through the meats, you can infuse flavor. So the idea here is maybe make the product a little bit more ready to eat. Uh, obviously, this is a wonderful place and a wonderful lifestyle. I mean, I, I love the outdoors and, and working with plants and animals and all this sort of thing. And it's a wonderful place to do that. It's also a wonderful place to raise my three kids. Um, they've all grown, gone on to be college-educated professional people. and. Um, I don't know what else you could ask for. I mean, it's, it's great. Uh, the majority of the population realizes that we have a jewel here. It's unique, really.